Good evening, friends near and far. I'm Tracy Diamond, the Adult Services Coordinator at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And thank you for joining us for today's special event, The Art of Reading, featuring Kellen Spera, author of First Become Ashes. Ooh, there's a little bit of a play, but there it is. Um, we also hope you'll join us for some upcoming events. Next week, we have Never Judge a Queen by the Cover with Ada Vox, hosted by Baltimore's Drag Performer of the Year, Yvonne Dior Michelle. That's uh, the 18th at 7 p.m. And we're also hosting B.D. Wong in conversation with Joel Kim Booster on the 19th at 7 p.m. So check out prattlibrary.org for more upcoming events. Um, today, we're so thrilled to have the second Art of Reading event with Kellen Spera and Christine Shaka. The Pratt and Walters have worked together to bring an event that marries literature and art. Our goal is to highlight their intersections and bring you, the audience, into the conversation. I'd also like to highlight the Fine Arts Department in Central Library and the State Library Resource Center. It's an arts resource unique in its size, scope, and depth among public libraries in the state. The collection features information on a wide variety of topics, including visual arts, architecture, music, antiques and collectibles, interior decorating, fashion, and crafting. So you're welcome to come check it out. Pratt is currently open at 25% capacity, and next week we will be opening at 50% capacity with, of course, continued safety measures in place. So now I'm going to turn it over to Allison Gulick to say a few words, explain virtual logistics, and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Tracy. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those of you who haven't read the novel yet, a brief summary will be placed in the comment section of both our Facebook and YouTube streams. And after introducing our speakers, we'll have about a 30 minute um, conversation between the, the two of them. And around 640, we'll close out of the live portion and transition to Zoom for a private, um, more intimate Q&A with both Christine and Kellen. Um, and following the Q&A, we'll continue into a small group discussion about the book. So I'm gonna start by introducing, doing formal introductions, and then we can get rocking and rolling. Okay, Kellen Spara is a queer and trans author who lives in Baltimore, Maryland with a tiny dog who may make an appearance, maybe. <laughs> He is the author of the novel Docile and Small Changes Over Long Periods of Time, a Hugo and Nebula nominated novelette about a gay trans man who is bitten by a vampire. More of his fiction can be found in publications such as Uncanny Magazine, Lightspeed, and Shimmer. Christine Shaka is the Walters Associate Curator of European Art. Christine was a curator of illuminated manuscripts at the Paul J. Getty Museum for 10 years and she has worked at the Met Cloisters and the British Library. Her book publications include Florence at the Dawn of the Renaissance, Painting and Illumination, and Illuminating Women in the Medieval World. She is currently developing an exhibition on Ethiopian art at the Walters. So now Tracy and I will bid you adieu and uh, Kellen and Christine can get into their conversation. It's just us. Just us I'm going to do this. So um, I really um, got pulled in by this book, Kellen. I mean, I volunteered to do this. I, I liked hearing <laughs> the summary of it, and then I was not—I was not disappointed. It was a super fun book. Um, I think first and foremost because you said it right here in in Baltimore. So these are places that um, I know well, and you know well, and it's always fun to to watch a story playing out in in a place you know. I think um, I also felt a great sympathy for the characters um, who the the fellows and the anointed who are kind of um, thrown out from the world that they've known this isolated world into the city um, into the outside world and it made me think of um, you know I'm a medievalist by training so it made me think if we sort of drop medieval people into our 21st century uh, world how confused they would be about um, <laughs> like so far cosplay and just even uh -huh. cars and you know all these things that we take for granted so um i felt i felt a great sympathy for for those characters um and of course you know being a, a curator of medieval art i really 
turn to the objects at the Walters to think about um, how some of them might resonate with with what you're this wonderful story that you're weaving through through the book. And um, my first thought was, of course, um, that you know monsters are sort of everywhere in the medieval world. Um, and um, I take a lot of my cues from uh, my great friend, uh, Asa Simon Mittman, who has published some some books on, um, on medieval monsters and the exception of monsters in the Middle Ages. And so I had to credit him for, for most of what, what I know. Um, but I was thinking about um, Last Judgment imagery in particular, and I put on the screen here a one folio from our de Brailles hours um, showing in fact the last judgment and um, this is a you know parchment manuscript with these wonderful um, set of full page images and this one in particular shows Christ at the top of the scene and you can see he's sort of dividing the scene between the the saved and the damned and below him um, the various individuals are meeting meeting their fate so um, on the um, just under his uh, right hand, you have the save. They're sort of being being gathered into under the arm um, of a of a waiting angel, and then on the other side, you have this horrible demon who's shoving the damned into um, into hell. And hell here is represented by a giant gaping maw of a beast. So um, it's you know, what, what medievals refer to as a hell mouth. So um, you know, hell is a mouth <laughs> of a beast. You know, this is one conception of, of a monster that was very, very real to medieval Christians. Um, and they thought about this a lot. You know, they thought about their their mortality and what would happen to them if they didn't live a good Christian life. And so um, you didn't want to meet meet that sort of that sort of uh, fate. So um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about. You know, I was trying to visualize your monsters in the book as as I was reading through it, and I. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how you chose to portray um, both monsters and and foes or, or FOEs, foes in the in the book, and and <laughs> anything that you might have been building on, or what what sorts of things you were thinking about. Sure. I mean, first of all, my point of reference for the Hellmouth is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this is this is not too far from that. I can I can picture this exact uh, this exact uh, you know scene. Uh, in my 90s childhood watching uh, urban fantasy television. Um, that was not the basis of my, uh, you know, for my monsters. Um, but uh, so, <clears throat> you know, in the book, there are sort of two levels of monsters. Um, there's the foes, F-O-E's. This is a very author moment, feeling clever at my abbreviation, also having a double meaning. Um, stands for forces of evil. Also a foe is an opponent. So foes are sort of like, um, they're not monsters, but they are humans that have sort of been uh, hyper corrupted by monsters um, <clears throat> such that they enforce um, the worst the worst aspects of corruption uh, in this setting. You know, the Fellowship of the Anointed exists to... Uh, everyone inside the fence is safe and protected by magic and everyone on the outside is exposed to this corruption from monsters. And so uh, when they are freed, liberated from the cult against their will, uh, they are in the territory of monsters, so to say. And so foes, uh, they are taught, are people who uh, enforce the status quo and thus do things like wear uniforms. Like that's how they're taught to recognize foes and but for you know for people who have lived such a sheltered life uh that uniform doesn't just mean a cop or a security guard or an fbi agent it means the person working at mcdonald's who's giving you your order it means you know, they don't know what you know what to look for so foes are sort of this ever um sort of sort of always lurking presence you know they look like people but they're not and uh, people can sort of become corrupted uh, to become foes. And, you know, for example, Meadowlark, who is the protagonist, it is his partner, Cain, who sells the cult out, who realizes that they've been hurt and abused and lied to their whole lives. And so, you know, Lark, who is still convinced, who is a believer, thinks Cain must be so corrupted that he is turning into uh, a foe. And it's one of those, uh, you know, evils that walk amongst us type thing. Now, this hell mouth here is not going to walk amongst us. But, you know, there is 
there is a larger quest that Lark is undertaking to fight a monster that he believes is very real. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in this book, one of the things I really wanted to get across was that our belief, our beliefs uh, color how we see things. And so for him, you know, he's seeking a very real monster and uh, we see through his point of view in his chapters, a real monster battle, uh, whether that is actually occurring, whether he has been lied to, whether this is all real or fake, you know, is sort of up for debate um, and in the mind of the reader at that point. But um, my monster, you know, I was picturing, you know, I, not too far from this, but a definitely much larger um, sort of a Balrog-esque, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, Lord of the Rings um, sort of references because one of the characters is a cosplayer. He's sort of the one who helps the protagonist on his quest. And, uh, you know, you I said- I love that feature. That was fantastic. <laughs> you were talking about how if you had some medieval people and you plop them down, I was thinking that there's a very specific line even in this book where um, Calvin, the, the cosplayer, uh, says something like the man out of time trope is so cute in reality, you know, which is, you know, they're not out of time, but they almost are because they're out of sync with the rest of the world. So, you know, Lark's looking for a very real monster and this sort of split at the bottom of this image where you have the saved on one side <clears throat> and like the, uh, you know, those going to hell on the other, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's how they felt inside the cult. They were the ones saved, you know, our images are inverted. So I keep, you know, on this side of the um, photo and, uh, you know, everyone else in the regular world on the outside is sort of slowly shuffling into the beast's uh, mouth, whether that is metaphorical or real. Yeah, I had this moment, I'm glad you brought up the, the concept of, you know, belief and believing. And, you know, one question I get a lot, you know, we have in our galleries, we don't have an image here, but I was thinking as I was reading this, you know, we have a lot of medieval reliquaries. So these are very beautiful containers that would have contained the remains of a saint or of the cross on which Christ was crucified. And, you know, one question I've gotten a lot when I've given tours of the galleries throughout my career is, you know, is that a real piece of Saint so-and-so? And, you know, I think what you have to remember is that in the Middle Ages, you know, as long as the faithful believed it was a fragment mm -hmm. of a particular saint, it was that. And so that's really what's important there, whether or not, you know, it is today or whether or not, you know, we could assemble the body of St. John the Baptist when he would have five arms, you know, that's kind of irrelevant to the whole thing. What, you know, it's, it's about belief and that's sort of the core of things. And I kind of got that from, from your book as well. So yeah, not the History Channel special, like, is this the real? Right, right. Nose of Jesus? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if it was to that person, then mm -hmm. <laughs> who am I to tell them otherwise? Exactly. Now I know we have a, we do have a lot of images here. Um, Allison, oh, no. can I have the next Sorry, slide. That first no, one no, no. I, I, this is we could go on for hours just with that one <laughs> that one image. I mean, um, <clears throat> these sorts of images really pervaded um, all aspects of life, even places in the you know you wouldn't have expected. Like they were in the cloisters where only monks would have seen them. You know these horrible hell mouths and monsters, and you would think, well, this is supposed to be a holy or sacred place. Why would you want that? Well, of course, there's always this reminder that there's evil in the world and that's something you have to fight against. And I think that's what, you know, some of your, your characters are, are trying to do. They're setting out on that quest to do that. Mm -hmm. um, also reading through your book, I was thinking a lot about um, various types of amulets and things that people would have worn in the Middle Ages to protect themselves from some of these forces of, of evil that were they believed to be in the world. And um, I have one example here, this um, little brooch or pin. And it's got an inscription on it that I'm sure you all can't read, but it says um, Ave Maria or Hail Mary. It's sort of these words of the angel Gabriel when he greets um, the Virgin Mary to tell her she's going to give birth to Christ. And this is something that somebody could have worn on their body. It's very, very tiny. It's only about um, maybe two inches high. But oh, some sort of pretty big, though. Yeah, it looked well. It looks massive road. on the screen. <laughs> but it's a <laughs> little. Thing. We have it on view in our galleries. Um, please come in, come and visit us. And um, along those lines, Allison, could we have the next? Um, another type of amulet that was worn, um, especially in um, in Italy. We've got. I have a painting here 
um, of the uh, Madonna and Child with some angels. And if we have the next slide, when you zoom in on the figure of the Christ child, you see that he's actually wearing a necklace made of these um, coral beads and sort of a piece of um, a piece of coral, a little pendant hanging from it. And we actually have an example of such a pendant in our collection as well. Um, and um, this was the sort of thing that were, was given to children after they were born. Of course, infant mortality was quite high um, in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And this was thought to sort of ward off evil spirits that might come and take take the life of the child or make them ill. And so um, quite often, um, especially in Italy and Southern Italy, um, where the painting was made, uh, we have these examples of coral jewelry that the Christ child wears as sort of this protective um, device. And um, I know that jewelry plays and, and amulets play a bit of a role in your in your novel as well. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah. And, you know, before just like for 10 seconds, because I saw the beautiful scroll and you mentioned like everyone come into the Walters to see, <clears throat> see these items in the exhibits. Um, I do need to say that, like, you know, one of the reasons I was so excited to do this um, event was because I used to write. I used to live near the Walters and I used to come in and write. Uh, they're open on until 9 p.m. on Thursdays at least in pre-COVID times. It's um, coming back. It's coming back. We are going to be open later real soon. So hold your like, on there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I highly suggest for creatives, you know, in the area, you know, come be inspired by some art and like, just like sit amongst beautiful creations and soak it in while you're doing your work. You know, I also <clears throat> wrote almost this entire book at the Enoch Pratt uh, central location. So I'm very excited to be vaccinated and moving towards 50% capacity. Um, so everyone watching, make sure you go visit these incredible institutions uh, in Baltimore, um, but these amulets. <clears throat> so first of all, big fan of the coral necklace. It looks great on you, baby Jesus. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, so in First Become Ashes, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, how we had the divide between the those who are do this backwards, those who are being saved and those who were going into the Hellmouth. And now that was between those who were, you know, members of the Fellowship of the Anointed and and those on the outside. But within the cult, there's even further divisions. So there are the anointed and then there are the fellows, you know, like you mentioned, and the fellows are normal for lack of a better word and the anointed are sort of chosen one and they're not anointed by um any kind of god or deity but they are anointed by the cult's leader nova and they do have specific signifiers that they wear um that have some effects that they feel are sort of real and some are that symbolic um so they the anointed have their tongues pierced a uh, thing that I'm too scared to do, but thought was cool. <laughs> um, so the tongue piercing uh, amplifies their magic when they speak the words. <clears throat> and um, uh, oh, baby Jesus with a tongue piercing is actually a medieval art that I want to see now. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the anointed ones, uh, their, uh, you know, their magic is perpetuated by self-discipline. And so um, part of that is abstinence. And so they wear chastity devices, which, you know, they are believers, so they would not break that rule on purpose anyway. Um, but they, they do wear them to remind themselves, like to have that piece of that physical uh, reminder always with you. I think, you know, that's why lots of times, like even people who wear, you know, faith symbols on necklaces um, or you wear wedding rings and things like that, you know, a wedding ring isn't going to make you keep your vows, but it's a reminder of your spouse and how much you love them. Uh, I say as a very not married person, um, but, you know, so even within the, the fellowship of the anointed, they are, uh, you know, engaging in this sort of symbolic separation of them, uh, from the rest of the cult members, but also those those denotation denot demarcations, uh, they and and you know they have real they have real meaning. Those those uh, anointed the chosen ones, they think you know that that piercing is doing something. And you know who am I? I know as the author to say who am I to say if it's working or not. But you know, like I said, that's sort of all up to belief. Right here, we see. You know, we have the amulet uh, from the previous slide and we have the 
um, coral here and the people wearing it believe that it works and you know, it's their, it's their bodies and wearing a talisman doesn't really hurt anyone else. So, you know, if, if you want to do that, then you all, you know, power to you. So I think that's a really cool thing that like has carried down throughout time. You know, we all do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do have sort of a post medieval example in the next slide, um, which kind of carries us out. And this is actually probably a much older tradition um, in, um, in Ethiopia. I have an example of um, an Ethiopian healing scroll in the Walters collection. Um, a little bit confusing how I've laid them out, but the long skinny strip you see down the center, that's the entirety of the scroll. And then I just show you a detail of um, one of the figures on the scroll there. Um, it's actually the angel um, Fanuel. And um, quite often these healing scrolls would have images of, saints, of angels, um, apotropaic things like the evil eye um, on them. And they were basically commissioned by everyday people who had various ailments or things that they wanted to protect themselves again against. And they would go to um, a Dabtara, who's a sort of um, um, in the church, but not an ordained priest. And they would tell him um, their problems and the things that they wanted to heal about themselves. And he would write a series of prayers and images on this scroll. Um, the scroll itself, this particular one is about um, five feet, five inches long. And so typically, long. <laughs> they were made, yeah, well, typically they were made to the height of the individual who commissioned them. So it is actually, you know, it's person height. And many of these were, as we find, um, some great research being done recently about these. Many, many of them were commissioned for women. And this particular one, um, you can often read the names of these individuals if you can read um, the the um, the Ethiopic lettering on there. And this particular one was commissioned for a woman um, named Marta. And Marta believed that she was possessed by the devil. And so all these prayers were meant to um, to rid herself of of that of that scourge. And so she. Um, you know, you could either hang something like this above your bed, rolled out as you see it there, or also in the corner there, I'm showing you um, these leather cases, these cylindrical leather cases that they would have been fit into. And you can see that there's a cord attached to it. So you could actually wear this around your neck as an amulet all rolled up. You know what the prayers say. It's very, very powerful um, image. And I was just before the presentation looking at this image of this angel again and many of these angels that you see in Ethiopian art are brandishing swords. And so it made me think of, um, you know, just um, Lark and sort of, he's gathering his weaponry and he's going out to, to, to find these monsters and to slay them. And um, that all kind of came together for me in this image. Um, so I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how you think about the, the concept of, you know, you talk a lot about magic in the book and a, a lot about, um, healing and all of these sorts of things. I think that's all kind of rolled up into um, things like this Ethiopian healing scroll and, and also the amulets that we saw. Yeah, I mean, and always my first thought when, when I see this image is like, we're really putting Marta on blast here. Like, I mean, this was her private healing scroll and here we have all five feet of it. Uh, I mean, not location within the museum, not on display. So uh, I feel less like we're getting into her business, but um but um, yeah, I mean, so the, I think I uh, alluded to this a little bit earlier, but um, so magic in the book is uh, informed by the discipline of those who practice it. And the way that they sort of charge up their power is through pain. Um, and we had discussed um, a bit of uh, self-flagellation um, that also was a common occurrence um, back in the day, back in ye olde, olden days. Um, and that was definitely a part of an inspiration uh, for uh, how how the sort of magic, internal magic system works, right? So how they perceive of magic working uh, as cult members. So, you know, there was, um, there was abstaining, like I said, um, there was the chastity, um, but there was also, you know, that extended to not, uh, not playing cards or and having junk foods or having fun most mostly um but also like direct uh application of pain so the um the anointed ones are partnered with each other and and hurt each other um which is uh you know this is part of where the book gets into issues of um belief and consent and agency because some of the anointed ones are 
more more of believers than others are are more zealous and so such as lark um so he fully believes this and so has been through quite a lot um in order to fulfill his quest and you know there is um you know, I want to touch on healing a little bit too, because of, you know, this very specifically as a healing scroll. And there is a scene in the book. Now, this isn't a, this isn't a spoiler. There's some healing magic. Um, so he is fleeing from uh, an FBI agent. Uh, a bullet has grazed him. And, you know, he's with this cosplayer uh, who's taken him on a quest in his hatchback. Uh, the cosplayer's <laughs> name is Calvin. He's a very sweet boy. Um, who desperately wants magic to be real. So, you know, he knows that Lark is hurt and they stop at a motel on the side of the road. And this scene takes place not from Lark's point of view, but from Calvin's. And, and from Lark's, you know, we would have seen that full belief. You know, he's performing healing magic on himself. He knows it works. The end. It's sort of um, It's sort of a calculation at that point. But for Calvin, you know, it's more of this, sort of you know the 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 hopeful expression of of healing and magic that sort of mm -hmm. um wanting to believe in this power and so he watches lark heal himself and isn't super sure what he's seeing um but he feels a little off but it also feels right so um the experience for him is almost trippy um and he's not sure what he believes and so uh, you know, I think there's this sort of grappling for different characters at different points throughout the book. You know, Calvin's belief sort of becomes stronger, whereas Lark is struggling with his. And, you know, how does belief play into magic and healing? And when I see the scroll, you know, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, Marta really thought, you know, the culture that she was a part of, this was exactly what had to be done. And she took the initiative to, I mean, I'm making all this stuff. I don't know the history. Somebody might've been like, here's your scroll, Marta, take it, <laughs> or you're out of this house. You know, so but like, you know, it's got the cord, you can carry it around with you. Um, it's clearly an important object and, um, you know, it's very personal. And I do, you mentioned the image of uh, the angel holding the sword and Lark mm -hmm. is very much like the, the armed angel as far as like mm -hmm. biblical imagery goes you know like uh he sort of carries this like bag of weapons with him everywhere and doesn't understand why he can't take them into like a rest stop <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or like a motel they're like you kind of have like just so many swords in your bag <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh so yeah that image um is uh evergreen yeah no for sure and i think um you know just talking about it, it's kind of like um you know, every medical test, right? The testing out new drugs, it's like, there's always a placebo, right? And it's sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, if you believe that you're getting the real thing, well, maybe, maybe it'll actually work, even if you're taking the placebo, right? It's a, a lot of, you know, mind over matter and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, these, these scrolls, you know, they, I, I just love how personalized they were. And as you say, like, you know, each of your characters is a little bit different in how they um, follow the beliefs, you know, of, of their, of, you know, of their, of their fellowship and, and what have you. And, um, you know, I don't know if we want to touch upon, well, we don't actually have, we, I think we have a couple more images. I don't want to, I don't want to run out of time, um, but um, maybe we should go into the the next one. What do you think? Sure. We can, we avoid, we can always fill at the end. We got, we can talk. <laughs> we got some more stuff. Um, so the other figure that made sort of occur to me when um, I was reading your book was the figure of St. Michael. And he was a very important um, figure for medieval Christians. Um, one of his great claims to fame was sort of, he was a, you know, a demon slayer and he's actually thought to be the saint who, who actually does that weighing of souls. Sometimes he'll actually hold a scale um, you know, the saved versus the damned, and he'll 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 weigh the souls at at last judgment. Um, but some very famous images of him um, have him actually trampling and slaying the dragon. And so I wanted to show you two images. The first one is this one here, a really beautiful um, crozier or a bishop's staff. You're just looking at the curl top part, but it's uh, when you see it on display in the Walters, it's it's on a long, um, actually modern staff, but it gives you a sense of um, something that it's like a crook. It's basically uh, modeled on a shepherd's crook. 
And this curled form that you see here, it contains um, this striding figure of St. Michael. And you can see his wings kind of behind him and he's taking his lance and he's stabbing this kind of um, almost giant salamander <laughs> like um, <laughs> dragon. Um, and again, um, you can imagine this would have been in a bishop's hand. So why would you want this sort of, you know, evil powers, you know, directly next to one of the most holy individuals in the, in the Christian church, right? And even the form of the crozier itself, this looped form, if you look real closely, it's actually the curved form of a serpent. So, um, and that's containing the whole scene. And there's even, you know, scales depicted in enamel work. Um, it's a beautiful piece of um, Limoges enamel. Um, but the idea is that the whole scene and that, that power, that evil power is contained within that loop um, and contained within the bishop's hand. So um, again, it's sort of, um, you know, it's the devil, you know, right? It's like, it's that, it's that power and, and able to, um, ability to um, sort of quash evil, to quash the devil um, because of, of belief in Christ in this particular, this particular case. Um, did you want to mention anything about, yeah, this sort of made me think of um, obviously the quest that, that, um, um, the anointed have, which is to go out into the world and, and, mm -hmm. and save the world by I, mean, I feel like St. Michael, like Michael and Lark would probably be good buds except for their <laughs> totally diverging theologies. <laughs> you're like, oh, you're also on a quest to slay a monster? Same. And St. Michael's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's not this way. It's like basically a, an iguana. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, actually, and a thing that I hadn't thought of previously when, um, you know, until I until I was focused on this image just now, is that there's actually, um, you know, so lots of Lark's weapons are, uh, you know, knives and bows and arrows, um, but he also has a sort of thing that is like a wand um, mm -hmm. and it's called Spellslinger and it's been charged with like all this magical energy. And it almost reminds me of this here and now because, you know, when you think about the... I mean, I, so I have a master's in theology um, from Harvard Divinity School, but I am absolutely not trained in like the art of uh, counseling people or, you know, being a spiritual advisor. And it also has been 10 years <laughs> since I graduated. So some grace on this account, but it sort of reminds me of, you know, um, there is a sort of mysticism and um, like to carrying staves um, that hold like the sort of this power, like these, the staff is empowering to the bishop that holds it, um, you know, or the, um, you know, the holy water or, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, what they call braziers, um, that the incense, you know, there's sort of, you're creating this like atmosphere and these are objects that are important and powerful in their own right, um, like as spiritual artifacts basically. And, you know, though the anointed aren't spiritual in that way, you know, the, this is an object that for Lark has power and that he brings with him uh, on his quests and actually directly uses it um, in his final battle uh, with the monster. Um, though, you know, I think about, um, I think about when I see some of these images of St. Michael and the drag, the dragon, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, St. Michael and his dragon are sort of equally matched here. Uh, and I think that sort of speaks to how powerful they viewed St. Michael, you know, he's uh, imposing, he's an imposing figure over this dragon. Um, and, but Lark, when he reaches uh, his monster, it is huge. You know, it rises out of the highway. He is very small to reach it. He has to climb up its knees. Um, and so, you know, there's that sort of scale um, as symbolic for sort of like confidence and power. And, you know, I think Lark is sort of at the end of his, uh, his sort of belief, faith journey questioning mm -hmm. and it's sort of an, a last, almost a last ditch effort um, to believe or know. And I don't think that's at all the case for St. Michael. I think this is St. Michael being like, I've got this one spear straight through the iguana's throat and that baby's mine. Uh, you know, this is an expression mm -hmm. of power and confidence, you know, whereas for Lark, it was a, a, an expression of sort of desperate, desperate hope and 
and confusion and longing. And so, um, you know, I feel like uh, Lark and Michael, friends in the beginning, but truly diverging on their paths. Well, maybe um, Lark could be friends with David of um, David and Goliath fame, right? I mean, you know, he sort of yes. uses his wiles to slay this giant, um, this giant Goliath, you know, and he figures out how to do it. He uses his brains rather than his his brawn, right? To do mm-hmm. that, um, so maybe they would they they would be better friends. I don't know, but I think um, <laughs> I'm ready for this uh, like crossover fanfic that is like the Bible. <laughs> It's not right here, folks. New idea, new book coming out next. Um, I just wanted to bring up the last image we have of St. Michael, because this kind of gets to your point about, um, yeah, we had this conversation about with this image, um, this Italian painting of Michael slaying the dragon and scale and, um, and that sort of thing. And of course, um, here he's, he's wearing um, battle armor. He's wearing kind of a, it almost looks like a fabric version of a, of a cuirass sort of Roman breastplate um, sort of, um, you know, regalia. And um, he has a shield. He has the sword that he's driving right into the dragon's mouth. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more about, about this one? Absolutely. You know that I love Michael's getup in this. Ad- oh, we take Michael again. This is Michael. Yeah. I, okay. This is Michael. Yeah, I mean, this is Michael. No, I, love, <laughs> I love Michael's outfit in this one. Um, this is such a, like a beautiful, um, so bright and colorful. I love that the art from this period um, was so bright. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think that these are like semi like royal feeling colors to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, once again, we have like this almost mirrors back to uh, the saint that was on the uh, healing scroll, right? Because you have mm-hmm. sort of like an angel, um, the wings are spread, but like also here's your weapon. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's it's got this very like um, white knight um, savior. I mean, not the savior. I wouldn't want to blaspheme Michael or anything. Um, <laughs> um and uh, this dragon looks a little more uh, dragonish, but also another very small dragon, which is funny because I mean, you know, all the de- all the depictions of dragons, I say all. <laughs> I'm absolutely not going to speak for everything. Many of the depictions of dragons, you know, that I have seen that I saw in fantasy and media mm-hmm. uh, and art even growing up was a sort of big looming presence. You know, you have the smogs. Um, I watched Dragonheart when I was a kid a lot, uh, where the dragon gives a piece of his heart to the son of a king or something like that. Um, and in all these depictions, we have this sort of tiny, wimpy looking dragon, almost as if like, was this dragon even a threat? Um, it really seems like the what they're trying to get across here is um, this sort of absolute confidence um, in the power of you know christ and or god both um and uh you know for lark like the battle just absolutely does not look like this so even when he is um battling off the foes uh throughout the novel those foes do look like people but they still are you know um they still unnerve him they have you know their eyes look off Mm -hmm. and they are sort of fuzzy and they sort of almost bend the way you see them um, in space time. Um, And so, uh, you know, Lark is really in sort of a belief, a belief crisis. Um, And I think that really influences uh, his, his, uh, you know, the image, if this were Lark, you know, it would be him much smaller looking up at something much larger and imposing um, and wearing not as good of an outfit. So, <laughs> and, and yet, though, I mean, you know, at, well, I don't want to give away too much, but, you know, he he has support, maybe not mm-hmm. within himself, but he has outside support. And here is just, you know, Michael. Michael has support yeah. from God, right? So he's he's the big, he's the, you know, he's got, it's, it's sort of, you know, the hierarchy here is that he's he's grown to this great size because um, yeah. he has God on his side. And I think Lark has a lot of people on his side too. And that's kind of where, where he's getting a lot of his strength from. Absolutely. <sighs> Are we near the end of our time here? I think yeah, I think so. I think, I think we're going to have some. This some was so wonderful. <laughs> this was really fun. <laughs>
You guys did awesome. I think this is maybe one of my favorite talks we've had so far. Um, high five, Christine. Yeah, seriously. Virtual also, <laughs> the Dragonheart reference just took me back. Dennis played. <laughs> um, uh, so we're going to wrap up here in this live stream space, but we are going to transition to Zoom and um, to have a more intimate Q&A. So if you... Um, would like to join us in that space. The information um, is in the comment section. So we're gonna transition into Zoom. Um, we'll have some Q&A time and then we'll do some breakout, um, more conversation about the book for those of us who have um, had a chance to really dig into it. Um, I wanna take a minute to thank both of you all for um, your work and preparing for this program. It really um, was really a super fun program to work on um, and I want to remind people that they can. Uh, this is where they can see us right now for the time being, as far as um, programming. So the museum is open, but a lot of our programming is still happening online. So um, we hope that you'll you will join us um, next week for a talk with uh, an artist talk with Lisa Hook and Con H Lay um, at five thirty in this space. Um, but now we're we're going to wrap up and um, head over to Zoom. And don't forget to head over to the Walters and the Enoch Pratt when you get a chance. Yes, get your copy of First Become Ashes. You can check it out from the Pratt or you can get it from the Ivy Bookshop. So either support your local library, support your local independent bookstores, and of course, support your local museums too. This has been awesome, Christine and Kellen. Thank you. So wonderful to be here. <laughs>